I think we are live. Chris, can we get a thumbs up, thumbs down on, oh, not Chris, Amanda, can we get a <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down on whether or not you can hear us? Hello, hello. Okay. All right, we've got a thumbs up. Awesome. All right, Laura, take it away. Yes. Uh, thank you guys for joining us on this snowy day. Uh, we hope that you guys had a good snow day and are keeping warm inside. Today, we are here for our December book talk. Um, we read and are going to be discussing Speak, the graphic novel adaptation by Lori Halls Anderson, illustrated by Emily Carroll. Um, I know the novel version of this is super popular, so probably some of you guys have read that, uh, but we went with the graphic novel this time. There are some pretty big trigger warnings for this book. We are going to be talking about themes of sexual assault, mental health, and we might touch on self-harm. So if those are sensitive topics to you, definitely just be careful with this one. Uh, we will have some resources in the chat that I believe are also down in the corner of this image right here for the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center and RAIN if you need any support with the issues that we are talking about. Um, but with that, I think we will get started. So... Should we introduce ourselves? Oh yes, I forgot that not everyone knows who we are. <laughs> How dare they, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Laura. I'm a teen librarian at the Central Branch of Boston Public Library. And with me, I have my two colleagues. I'm Allie. I'm a youth librarian at the Brighton Branch of the Boston Public Library. And I'm Jackie. I'm a youth librarian at the Adams Street Branch. So now we'll get started for real. Um, so like we said, I think we're going to be starting out with some of the heavier topics. So if those are sensitive to you, um, maybe, you know, come back a little later in the stream. We're going to be talking then about some of the slightly lighter stuff. Um, but this book, Speak, is about a teenager named Melinda who is in her freshman year of high school. When the book starts out, um, you get the sense that something has happened. She doesn't really have any friends. She's really withdrawn. Throughout the story, you find out that she was assaulted at a party during the summer. She called the police because she didn't know what else to do. And when people found out that she had called the police to break up the party, they just you know, totally lost it on her. Everyone is ignoring her, shunning her. Nobody knows what happened. So that's kind of the basic plot of the story. Um, one question I did want to ask you guys, I know I had read the book before and reading this, I was kind of wondering, I know Allie, I don't think has read the novel. No, did you not. find it confusing at all going into this or was it pretty clear? Um, it was pretty clear. Um, I, I mean, I've obviously I'm a librarian, so like I'm around books <laughs> and I know, even if I haven't read a book myself, like I typically know like about the books that are on my shelves. And so I vaguely knew what Speak was about um, because it was really groundbreaking for um, when it was published and like with the issues that it covered um, and things like that. So I knew vaguely what it was about, but I didn't find it particularly difficult to follow um and the foreshadowing was set up really nicely so that be i knew what happened and like i knew what it was building to but i feel like there were enough hints that depending on the type of reader that you are you could either pick up on it or you could let the mystery kind of be there if you wanted it to and have you read the novel jackie i read it in like 
high school. I, so yeah. high I school. just like basically remembered like, oh, there was a sexual assault. That's all I remembered. So it was kind of like, I was able to like keep that mystery going for a, a bit of it. Interesting. Um, so I guess we can get started talking about the panels. Um, I think first we're going to talk a little bit just about the how the art really, I think, complements the story really nicely um, in terms of talking about anxiety and <laughs> sexual assault and these serious topics where you can really feel the emotions of that without it being too explicit. Um, so if you want to mm -hmm. go to the next one, Chris, we can start talking about that proper. Well, so Wendy does love book discussions. So she's here. She plays among <laughs> us and comes to book discussions. That's her, those are her hobbies. Wendy is our comfort cat for the stream. That's true. Um, so the first one that I picked out um, is this one where she's got the little rabbits popping around her, asking her all these different questions. Um, this is specifically about whether or not she should tell her former friend, Rachel, about what her attacker did because Rachel's starting a flirtation with her. Um, but I thought it was really clever how Emily Carroll used this sort of wolf rabbit motif throughout the story um, to symbolize that kind of monster attacker and her feeling scared um, in a way that wasn't too like violent on the page. I don't know. What, what did you guys think about that? Yeah, I will say I, so there was like the, the wolf rabbit kind of dichotomy going on, but I, they kept referring to the assailant as the beast, not necessarily like more of a wolf. Um, so I will say the rabbit thing a few times kind of got lost on me just because there wasn't like a whole lot in the text to like support the comparison. But I think from an artistic standpoint, it was a good choice because rabbits can die of like fear and panic. And it kind of feels like that's where Melinda's at is that she like her heart races and she like needs to escape and she's like a prey animal. Right. So I did kind yeah. of get it. Um, I didn't necessarily understand why some of the bunnies are evil. Like she had like, there's this one, there's a one page that ties into this that one that she has coming up don't okay. worry but she has two bunnies on each shoulder like the angel and devil on your shoulder but why are they both bunnies oh my god i answered my own question it's because her fear manifests itself in different ways i take back my question rescinded oh, look at that nice art emily carroll excellent work <laughs> beautiful yeah like the parts where she like when she went to the bakery, I think it was, to get breakfast and she sees yeah. uh, Andy coming out and just like freezes and she's like, maybe if I like don't move, he won't see me. Um, like that was probably like the most successful rabbit beast um, part for me. Mm. Her. Um, next slide. This one, I don't have that much to say about it necessarily, um, but her in the Alice in Wonderland house, I just kind of liked the imagery. But oh, yeah. I don't know if either of you guys wanted to talk about some of the other like literary illusions that we have in this book and kind of Maya Angelou as her, her I don't know, overseer. This image especially, like... I got this, like how easy it is to feel stifled living at home, um, especially if like your parents don't really know what's going on with you um, and you're kind of like feeling like a stranger in your own house. Like I got this. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Michelle had read this book in high school and she was, you know, the person who suggested that we discuss this as a group. Um, and I know that something she said about it was that she remembered reading it in high school and being like, oh, this person gets it. Like they, the author gets what it's like to yeah. hate going at high school and feel like you are outgrowing everything you've ever known. And I guess like for me, having grown up in a small town, I can like really relate to this of like feeling like you're like you, something inside of you is too big to stay where you are. Yeah. 
Next slide. Um, so here is the angel devil rabbits that we were talking about, um, or that Allie was talking about. In this scene, there's a boy in her school named David, who's like the only person who's nice to her after um, this party, pretty much. And he asks her if she wants to come over to his house for like pizza, I think. And she says no. And then she has this moment where kind of one side of her brain is saying, he wasn't going to try anything on you. It's not a big deal. He's a nice guy. Da, 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 da. The other side is, I don't want to be alone with him. What if he did try something? It's not safe. Um, and it's, again, the bunny imagery. But what I really liked about this, um, which kind of goes into what you were talking about with how the author just seems like really get being a teen, I felt that both the way Halls Anderson writes and the way Emily Carroll draws was just like such a true depiction of anxiety to me. So this idea that maybe intellectually Melinda knows that David does just want to be her friend, but that anxiety trauma part of her brain just can't let the logic, you know, override that fear feeling. Yeah, now that I'm on this bunny thing um, with Emily <laughs> Carroll, <laughs> um, I will say like too, like I think, oh, now I'm going to expound upon it as if I thought about this before right now, um, that there's like different types of fear in high school, right? So for her, there's this very real fear of that is born of trauma and all the awful things that are happening to her and the way that she is choosing to protect herself. But there's also like your regular high school fears, right? Like of like, you know, oh, if I go to this person's house, like, what if they try to kiss me, but I don't like them? Or like, what if I like them? Or like, what if they're just like being nice, mm -hmm. and they don't really want me to come over. And it does feel like in this moment, she is both like making decisions informed of her trauma, but is also like it remind it grounds you so much in this idea that she is still just like she is 14, 15 years old, like, she has all the pressures of school on top of now this trauma-informed response to everything she does. I almost wish there were like hundreds of bunnies on this page because I feel mm -hmm. like that is a more apt description of what it feels like to be a teenager at this time in their life. Um, just like constantly screaming like in opposite directions. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. And all the bunnies are always running in different directions too, like as fast as they can. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like they're never Yeah. Never like grab one long enough to be like, Oh, I I got one. I made it I made the choice. It's this is the choice. It's always like I made the choice, but oh, did I need to make that choice? Like so mm -hmm. Right. And just like overplaying everything after it happens for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um all right, Probably. next slide. Maestro. Uh, this one is Melinda. So the theme of the novel is, or the title of the novel is Speak, and kind of the theme of it is that she doesn't tell anyone what happened. She's keeping this inside. She's suffering in silence. Um, and in this panel, she's talking about how she hoped that by not talking about what happened, it would kind of go away. She could pretend it never happened. Uh, and obviously that is not the case. And at the end of the book, she does kind of find her voice. Um, so I just thought it would be good to have a discussion about how it can feel so easy to just be like, if I compartmentalize something difficult and don't talk about it, it didn't happen. But in reality, that just makes things harder. Yeah, I'm so, you know, there was like for a very long time, this idea of like keeping quiet about your trauma was how you forgot about it, right? And like we saw that, right. um, I don't know why for some reason, like what is sticking out to me about like what I've read about this stuff is like soldiers who would return from war with their PTSD. It was a lot of like, don't talk about it so that you can forget about it. And then, you know, years later, they were like, no, you need to talk about it because you need to process it. And I think, you know, there's differing schools of thought about whether or not you should spend a lot of time thinking about and unpacking your trauma. And if that is what's helpful for you, or if you should, do your best to continue to compartmentalize so that you can continue on with your life. Right. Um, and for Melinda, 
she doesn't feel that she has anyone in her life to unpack this with. And even if she did, at this point, like, it feels like she would just get told, like, oh, well, like, don't worry about it. Like, don't worry. Like, you'll feel better soon. And so, and she has also, like, the added layer of her parents are fighting all the time. So she can't go to them because they have their own right. issues. Yeah. So, poor And thing. then, like, this is, like, going really far into the book. But, like, the one time that she does try to tell someone... Um, I forget which friend, Rachel or yeah. Rochelle or whatever. Rachel called Rochelle. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like it blows up in her face and like the, her worst fears about actually speaking up, like come true. Yeah. 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 I think that you guys make a good point, which like we'll be coming back to the adults in her life a little bit later. But I think a lot of the times when you, particularly as a young person are struggling with something all the advice everyone gives you is just like talk to an adult go to therapy and that advice you know is good advice and it is valid but it does kind of knock it into the reality that it's not that simple um, and that not everybody has someone that they can talk to or knows how to access affordable therapy. Um, so I think that is kind of a, a good point. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was just another one that I thought was super accurate, like really getting to the point of portraying her kind of anxiety about this stuff really well. The idea of feeling like she has a snowball in her throat and that she can't even speak about something if she wants to. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, we've all kind of been there in the sense that like you get choked up about things or like the lump in your throat. Mm -hmm. And for her, it's like this thing that you feel like should be melting, right? Like her, the snowball imagery is so visceral because a snowball, if a snowball gets stuck in your throat, it melts. Eventually it will right. melt. And then you're not thirsty anymore because now you're hydrated. But <laughs> for her, her snowball is like not melting. Nothing she's doing is melting it. It's just sitting there freezing cold in her throat. And that's like such a visceral image. I would love to talk about my hit list of people in this book. And every single one of them is an adult in Melinda's life. Don't worry. We are getting there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm pumped. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready to fight. I can give you all the reasons I want to fight them and all the different ways in which I want to fight them. Truly cannot wait. Yeah, uh, let's go. Next slide. You've got a little while. We'll get there soon. I promise. Fine. Um, this was just some more wolf imagery that I thought was cool. I like how even on the pages where there aren't like proper um, illustrations, as it were, they're more like backgrounds. You still kind of get the movement of the story and this kind of wolf at the bottom. But we don't need to spend too much time on this one. We can go. I forward. think this was this was my favorite panel in the book, though, was this art. So yeah, there's Do that. Do you want to talk about it? No, I just really, I thought like this was just like a really important moment that it was like, I don't know, for me, it was like the clearest like drawing of this like wolf yeah. and like the feeling of being inside the jaws of the wolf. Right. Stuff like that, so um, welcome to Twitch Shell in the chat who loves this book. Thank you for nice. joining. Nice. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Um, all right. Next slide. I took these off because wearing them with the headphones is giving me a headache, but turns out I can't see without them. <laughs> like, a funny joke. It's weird. I know. Uh, Go figure. Another one, again, just like how well Emily, Emily Carroll draws panic. Like, I, I don't know that before reading this book, I could have thought that someone could draw a panic attack that felt like I was in the moment I could feel that mm -hmm. um so this panel kind of like the last one was for you I think this was definitely one of the most powerful moments for me because I could just like feel that feeling of being in a loud crowded room when you're panicking and just what it feels like yeah something I really appreciated um about Emily Carroll's art, because I didn't read the original novel, so I don't know how much this rings true for that too, is that like the thing, like the signs of her depression and her like worsening mental health were so well illustrated 
that you could mm -hmm. feel it. Like I felt the like sense of like, you know, as a person who I would hope like if I saw this at a friend or somebody that I knew I would do something about it. There was like a real urge in me to like kind of reach into the pages and be like, I, I want to help you. Let us like, let me help you. Right. And I feel like so much of that comes with from Emily Carroll making the panic and the depression feel so real and like, like it came off the page in a lot of ways. And in a way, I don't think the written novel like really could do because it's I mean different people process things differently but I think for this art in particular it really rang through yeah I don't think because it was so long ago I don't remember loving this book when I first read it mm -hmm. I loved this adaptation of it like for everything that you guys have said but even just this panel like if you see everyone around her they're just kind of like they're their body language is like open and like happy. And then you see her like at the very bottom of the page with people standing over her, like curled in on herself. I was like, yeah, she gets it. And that's such a relatable feeling, like even into the rest of your life, right? Like there's always those mm -hmm. moments where you're like somewhere you could be like at work and everybody else is having a great day and you're just having the time right. time and the exact <laughs> feeling that you have is what Emily Carroll put on this page like exactly. and this is what you wish like inside this is what you're doing even if on the outside you're still like having a good time everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. so. for sure uh next slide <laughs> Okay, so getting to talk a little bit more about some of the people in the book. Melinda has this sort of friend named Heather. No, don't even say sort of. This uh, evil yeah. succubus of a person. Yes. Parasite. Uh, who is a new girl at school who basically like is using Melinda for her artistic skills. Uh, I thought I liked this panel just because this is like one rare instance in the book where Heather, I think, is actually truly just being enthusiastic about the pep rally and not being manipulative and mean. Yeah. But Melinda is so anxious and has so much trauma that just the excitement, like you see Heather moving in on her and you can feel how it's attacking her. Um, but do you guys want to talk about just like Heather a little bit sure something Ugh. that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say something I did appreciate in meeting Heather in the first couple of pages was that Heather was new to school so she didn't have the knowledge or like hadn't heard about the party that Melinda called the cops at um right and so for us like we get to see Heather have this blank slate with Melinda like Melinda is going through all this stuff, but Heather's never known her any other way. And so there is a, you know, there would be a chance to be a good friend, but Heather like actively chooses not to. Um, but I will say something I did like is that it never felt like Heather held Melinda calling the cops against her. It never felt like she was like, oh, well, I heard you like broke up this party. Like that was never what Heather did to her she was just like oh you're like really depressing to hang out with which like you know is always a really fun thing to hear when you're a person in a depressive episode like I'm sure yep. that felt great Heather like but I do like this idea that Heather was new to school and that Melinda was likable to her in the beginning made Melinda more likable yeah. to me just kidding I would die for Melinda turns out Unlike the adults in her life. Sorry. Jackie, do you want to yell about Heather? Yeah, especially, like, I think I was, like, super angry at Heather when you, like, compare her to, um, what's the boy's name? David? Ah, oh, David. Her lab. Yeah. Because, like, you get the impression that he was part of this school. Like, he maybe knows what happened, but never, like, never holds it against Melinda at all. So, like, you have on the two sides, like, you have both of them who don't hold this thing against her, but they, like, go about it in, like, completely different ways. Yeah, but I guess, like, there's also this interesting, I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't think about it like that, but this interesting parallel now that David knows and doesn't treat her any differently, and Heather doesn't right. know. 
and doesn't treat her differently. So we have these two people in her life that David knows what she did and he is still trying to be her friend. And mm -hmm. even after Heather stops being her friend, David never really stops being somebody that she considers a friend. So like, I don't know that David is like, oh, this is my BFF Melinda. But like Melinda is definitely like, David is somebody that I trust. And for her, that's so hard to do. So like, yeah. shout out to David. Shout out to David. No shout like, outs for Heather. When she called him, uh, <sighs> when she called him about that, uh, yes. that like report presentation, I was at first I was like, oh, it's kind of like, weird that she would call him because i didn't get the impression that they were like phone besties but like the fact that she trusted him enough to go out on a limb and like ask for help for this yeah and then like the the end of that kind of situation when he was kind of like well you know the, the teacher the, the jerk teacher like had a point like the suffragettes like had to speak up to get their rights and you're not speaking up for yourself so it's like it's like complicated but in a way that like shows that david trusts her i think to actually tell her how he feels yeah david is very honest with her which i really appreciated because heather wasn't on like heather was so manipulative right like she was like right. oh like we're friends will you help me decorate the gym will you do some art for me but david was like oh i will help you do this and be successful at it but then when you ask right. me what my feelings are i will also tell you the truth about how i don't think that was the best choice like that was yes the best choice for you in the moment but that's not how you can best make change yeah. and listen apparently this is going to turn into the david fan club over here the other thing like i felt betrayed by heather because at first like i didn't remember that she was oh, being yeah. like manipulative throughout the whole thing so when i like realized what she was doing i was so angry on the window yes behind. yes <laughs> one of the I most thought... angry times i was in this whole book was when heather leaves her a valentine after she's dumped her oh. as a friend and melinda's like oh could it be from david and then it's a valentine from her former friend that just says like thanks for understanding and has their best friend necklace in it like returning the best friend necklace so cool. like you just keep it I just keep was it so angry <laughs> I, oh yeah. imagine being that like willfully ignorant of other people's emotions right? like okay also like not for nothing i understand they're in ninth grade they're not like you know we're adults so our view is a little bit different but i cannot imagine being in ninth grade and being like oh i don't want to be friends with this girl anymore because she's like really sad all the time so i thought i would do this one thing where i tell her we're not friends and i give back our best friend necklace because that won't make her sadder like Girl. That would make anyone like devastated, even if they weren't mentally in a terrible place. Heather has two <laughs> brain cells, and she shares at least one of them with the Marthas. So, like, there turns you out. <laughs> there you go. All right, next slide. Twitch Shell Three also agrees that Heather sending back the it's necklace more. and betraying it's so off a Valentine's Day girl. At least you say Patrick's Day. Christ. Um. <laughs> we're going right back down in mood again um this is i think the first moment that melinda sees her attacker after the party oh ali is grimacing i hate, I hate andy um like, yes for good reason. Is a like, horrible good reason. person but like my god i hate um, him this scene again i just thought like just like we've been talking about this whole time that the art kind of added so much to the story because with the solid background and the jagged lines and her heartbeat, even before you know what happened or why she's so afraid of Andy, you can just like feel it just looking at this page. Yeah. I mean, I, so like with this page, I, so I didn't know anything about this book going in except that vague thing. Um, and as soon as I saw this page, I was like, oh, we're about to meet him. I was like, I know what's about to happen. Like, I could feel mm -hmm. it. And when, I, when it came in on him, I was like, oh, God, I hate you. I was like, I know what you did, and I hate you. 
you know, an Emily testament to Emily Carroll that I think my own like heart rate picked up because I was like, oh, something bad is about to happen. Right. Fun. And like, I also think it's important, like the first time we see him, he just looks like a regular high school guy, like just, you know, kind of cute walking through the hallway. Like the fact that we don't first meet him as like the wolf or the beast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Something Chris brought up in the chat earlier was that with graphic novels, um, it's really hard to tell people's like ages, like more so than books where you can like invent your own. So for me, even looking at him, like I knew he was a senior. I think it had been mentioned by this point that it had been like a senior party that she was at. Um, mm-hmm. He looks so much older. And I mean, so does she in that sense, but also like the way he's drawn. Is he seven feet tall? He looks. He does seem tall. so <laughs> tall, <laughs> which again might be just like her perception, right? Right. But also, is this is this child seven feet tall? I have questions. Possible. Uh, next slide. Just some more wolf rabbit imagery. I don't know that we super need to go into it. Just another example of that. Uh, So we can go to the next slide again. Um, This I think was like the toughest panel in the book. Mm. She passes out in biology class. Um, Again, if you guys need support with any of the issues that we are discussing, we are dropping those links in the chat. Um, But I just thought this was important to include because it does really highlight how effectively both in writing and in illustration that they get across what happened without it feeling exploitative or, you know, overly graphic, but it's still really harrowing. Yeah, there's also this, right, like, so on top of everything else, we've been talking about how she's dealing with all this trauma in her life, and then also her parents are fighting, and she doesn't have any friends at school, and her grades are slipping, and then, I mean, I, like, would trip in gym class, and then you'd never hear the end of it, right, like, from anybody (laughs) in high school, like, she passes out in her class, so now this, like, lore is being built about, about her at the school and we saw that with Heather when she was like you kind of have like a reputation like now she's the weird right. quiet girl who also passes out in biology class like ugh, poor Melinda she like can't catch a break ugh, okay next slide hopefully the next one I picked is less sad but probably not oh it is oh yeah Uh, Yeah, 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 baby. I just wanted to include this for like, you know, I felt like we deserved it. But do do. you you want to talk about this moment in the story? I was just like, finally, like, it was like so cathartic. uh, Once we reached this point, like, not only is she using her voice, but she is fighting back. And I am here for it. Yes, kids, physical violence, very rarely the answer. (laughs) When it comes to Andy, absolutely the answer. Do it again. Bop, bop, bop. Like, uh, I was, it was like so, there is something to be said, right, about like the realism of these kind of things. Like towards the end, Andy was very much like, it was very easy to be like, you are a villain. You assaulted her. You don't feel bad about it. You don't feel that what you did was wrong. And you're willing to do it again. Like you're a garbage man. Right. Um, and her being able to be like, I'm going to punch you. And we know that that's not necessarily how it always plays out in real life, right? There's like gray areas and you don't always get the chance to face your attacker, stand back up to them and reclaim, you know, whatever you get from that interaction. But for Melinda in this moment, she finds her voice again to say the word that she said the first time. And this time she gets to like, make sure that he knows she means it. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, Ooh, do it again! Do it again! I think right, like, a little bit before this panel, there was a scene with, like, um, when she had written on the bathroom wall to, like, avoid Andy, and then she saw, like, all the other girls had written the same kind of message. Like, 
I feel like that was like the first step for her to be able to be like, all right, I can do something about this. And then this is like the culmination of that. Yeah. yeah, that when she saw the bathroom wall and other girls had written there, I was literally like, she's not alone. Like this has to, and her friend Ivy, we have to stand. Right. We yeah. love Ivy. Like being like, you have to stay after school. I have to show you this. And showing her this thing that she knew would help Melinda. And like, I don't know. It also was so reminiscent, right? Like th this is like an anecdote, but when I was in college, there was somebody who was like credibly accused of sexual assault a bunch of times and other girls would warn each other about it. like right. it was never like you know like even the people who felt alone like there was word of mouth girls and people in groups more likely to be oppressed or attacked by other groups of people find ways of telling each other to help each other protect mm -hmm. each other and for her for melinda to write his name on that wall empowered all those other girls too to speak up and they can protect right. each other like and that it so, felt and, kind of oh sorry nope oh, god it felt kind of like a precursor because this original book was published i think in the early 2000s kind of like a precursor to what we've seen on social media over the past couple years of women and other individuals being able to call out people who had sexually harassed or assaulted them in writing first, get that community and then kind of find their voice through that. Yeah, it's Melinda's like hashtag me too moment, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. she put it there, she raised her voice and a bunch of other women, girls at this school came forward and said me too, basically. Yeah. And we don't know that oh. any of them were like, assaulted to the at like extent that melinda was but we do know that he has made other girls feel at least some of the way that he makes melinda feel right um, and I mean, it's also it's interesting oh, no i'm no. sorry i just want to make sure we get um, to the adults because i know you guys have a lot to say <laughs> oh yeah um like so after the prom when uh rachel rochelle she's like in her moment because she was able to you know push andy off and tell him no yes. and then everyone thinks that like she's like so cool because she was able to do this like that i don't even know what to think about that but like it seems so unfair to me because this has been melinda's life the entire length of this book yeah it does make you wonder a little bit if she had you know if there had been a point in the story where she had been able to say it was him and he did this to me, what would have been different about our experience, right? Because right. it's not that different. Well, I mean, obviously, like, the end result is very different from Rachel's, but she does the same thing, right? Wait, she says no, she pushes him away. And while mm -hmm. Rachel succeeds and Melinda, like, is in a situation where th there's no witnesses and she's, like, very powerless, um, there is this idea that if she had done that what would be different like if she had gone back to that party and been like uh -huh, hold up y'all this just <laughs> happened 911 here we go like how right. different would that have been like i'm very happy for rachel good for her and like there is you know the nice parallel of one person being celebrated while another person suffers in silence but how you know how different could it have been if anyone in melinda's life had given her the chance to tell them what happened like maybe we right. would have seen her turn into a more heroic figure like rachel maybe it would have given her the space to process it differently than she did in isolation so uh, all right next slide uh this one i just thought was like a kind of nice hopeful slide of her realizing it's not her fault that she still has life ahead of her. I thought one thing that was really important about this story is, especially for coming out in the early 2000s, like you see so much about the perfect victim. Like if you did anything wrong, you're not going to have the credibility, which is not true. If you were assaulted, you were assaulted. It is never your fault. But Melinda is not the perfect victim and I think she does maybe at first kind of wonder did I say no enough did it matter that I'd had a couple drinks did it matter that 
I liked the attention at first, but I didn't want it right. to go any farther. Yeah. And the answer to all of those is no, he ignored your consent. He attacked you. You are not at fault. You did nothing wrong. Um, and I think this was kind of a nice way of showing how art helped her heal and tied into her realizing it's not my fault. He is entirely at fault. Yes, well said. All right, next slide. Um, I think this might be the last one before we get to the adults, so get ready. Um, but kind of playing off that idea of how toxic masculinity and rape culture affects everything about these types of situations and even her wondering, did she have any fault? Again, she did not. Um, this panel just kind of struck me as that even Melinda, someone who is struggling really hard with being judged, who is dealing with this trauma of sexual assault, she also is judging these other girls at her school. She's assuming that all the cheerleaders are sleeping with the football players. She's judging them for maybe presenting one way and acting a different way. Um, and I just thought it was interesting to see that even as she's coming to terms with the reality of her own experiences, her perceptions of others are still kind of colored by yeah. toxic masculinity. I will say the early 2000s, it was like the hip thing to like hate oh, yes. cheerleaders in particular. Right. <laughs> Wild. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like it was like you know really cool to slut shame like yeah. ha -ha. um but and i think you know a product of its time in a little bit of way like a little bit of the way is that mm -hmm. it is a book from the early 2000s so it is informed by those things yeah and but you're right like the toxic masculinity is there in the writing in the original book melinda i assume feels this way and it does inform the way that she interacts with people and so there is any, maybe any number of allies for her here, but she has just as much baggage when she looks at her classmates as they have when they look at her. Yeah. Right. All right. Our next slide is talking about her parent. A I lot think to bring it, Sorry. I think bring it on is also a, an effect, not a cause of that whole dichotomy of hating cheerleaders i don't know like it feels like there was growing up for me at least it felt like the villain was always very much like the bubbly popular cheerleader type you can see it in uh miss swift's you belong with me video like there is any number of these examples and i think bring it on is victim of that as well i don't know interesting perhaps some research later on <laughs> oh all right are we talking about yeah. our parents yeah i get away straight hate these folks um absolutely melinda come live with me i am your mom now i <laughs> i understand that in adult life you have your own stuff going on and it can be hard but if you cannot get over it to help the child that you brought into the world without their permission I don't know what to say to you. Like, they could see their daughter collapsing in front of them. They saw her grades mm -hmm. dropping like that. They saw her starting to act up at school and cutting school. And literally, at one point, her mom, like, wa literally says to her, I can't deal with this right now. And, right. like, leaves. And I have never been so angry in my life because if a single adult, especially her parents, had stopped for even a second and been like, what is different for you? Like, what right. made this happen to you? She wouldn't have had to live like this. Like, her parents <laughs> failed her so miserably. Her grade slipped. She started skipping school. And instead of wondering why this their daughter had become a different person, they were just yelling at her. I could scream. I could scream about this. <sighs> I wanted to believe that this was like an unrealistic portrayal of adults, but I don't think it always is. Like, I think this kind of thing happens 
a lot. And maybe it's teens who aren't showing their like hurt in, you know, as obvious ways, but it's just like, I mean, her mom said that in response to like her self harming and she just like walked out on her. Literally, literally sees cuts on her daughter's arms. Which, like, also in the early 2000s, there was, like, a huge movement to, like, start noticing right. self-harm tendencies in kids. And, like, she wrote Love on Her Arms was, like, getting real traction back then. Like, and mom looked at that and said, I don't have time for this. Your only child? A child Ugh. you created and put on this planet? You. You are the only. She is the only thing you should have time for. Are you kidding me? Oh. It yeah. It was when, flames on the side of my face anger. And when should they go to this school and they're talking to principal principal, which is hilarious by the way. Excellent work <laughs> there, uh, Lori Hall Sanderson. Um, when they're talking to him and they're like, You must have created an environment that's terrible for her instead of just mm -hmm. looking at her and being like, What's wrong? What happened? They're like, Let's blame all this other stuff. Like, no, your daughter is spiraling. Like very obviously spiraling and you're so caught up in your own garbage that <sighs> yes as someone who has a very good friend who is a high school school counselor i was so mad at the that school counselor. counselor in this book who did like nothing which again kind of going back to jackie and the parents like i want to say that that's unrealistic but i'm sure right. there are school counselors who just are like that and that's such a bummer i think count so you know parents i could kind of see that there's like there are parents who are checked out of their kids lives right yeah. so if they like they don't really notice things going wrong with their kids but they had like dinner together every night yeah and like again with mom seeing that and being like they were acknowledging it they just were yeah. refusing to do anything about it um, I mean, there were definitely things I did not confide in my parents when oh, I was in high yeah. school because I was like, "Get away from me, you weird grown ups! Like, you don't yeah. know, any you don't know anything about anything, mom! Like, you my don't God!" Understand. But like, I don't know. The mark of a good parent is finding a way to communicate with your kid about the real stuff. And there was just total abject failure yeah. sorry i'm trying to find mm -hmm. the one singular line the guidance counselor has where she's just like <laughs> maybe being in high school is just like really hard <laughs> and she's like is there trouble at home and then just kind of blames it all on them and makes it their problem right so like the school is being like it's the parents fault and the parents are being like it's the school's fault and melinda's being like consider it's andy's fault mm -hmm. but like yeah she said this Guidance counselor, literally her only advice is, I think we need to explore the family dynamics that play here. Which, yeah. like, she's not yep. wrong, but also she's not right. Melinda's guidance counselor. You know, we had three guidance counselors in my school of 500, and to see a guidance counselor, I literally just needed a letter of recommendation for college. I had to wait two and a half weeks. Like, can you imagine what that experience is like if you actually need an adult? Mm-hmm. All right, um, let's move to the next slide and talk about her art teacher, I believe, because I have a lot to oh, say man. about him. Mr. Freeman. <laughs> so her art teacher is kind of presented as this like helpful person who like helps her find her artistic voice and that helps her heal. But also all he does is complain to his students about the school budget, which is fair. Like that's a very real problem. We underfund the arts, I get it but screaming at your students about the school board every day is truly wild and not appropriate. That is for like the staff room. And he's just like angry all the time, like doing his own art, throwing things. He'll be really nice to her outside of class and then in class be like, all of your art is garbage. None of you know what you're doing. No, you have to for drop real. Them, even though you're deathly afraid of them, Ivy, I don't care. This man was wild. He, like, had his own, this is, I think, another example, right, of adults having their own stuff going on in their oh, lives. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. like, again, time and a place, buddy. Like, you get a therapist. You get one. When he, like, slashed his art in front of his <laughs> students, just was like, <laughs> I was like, 
oh, this man is, this man is losing it. <laughs> like, buddy, you're not being a paragon of mental health for your students. Like, of course, Melinda was like, ah, he gets it. Like, honey, yes, he also is having a bad time. Like, mm -hmm. oh, geez, Mr. Freeman, man. Also, kids, don't get in your teacher's cars. I don't oh, care. Yeah. I don't care. Oh, yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> that was, like, a weird moment for me in the sense that, like, she was with, when she was with Danny, she was, like, oh, he, like, she was going back and forth, but then she just, like, climbed in Mr. Freeman's car, and I was, like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm really jaded and cynical, but I sure wouldn't get into a strange older man's car. Also. This is definitely a product of the times, I'm sure. But, like, even when I was in high school, which was not that long after the early 2000s, a teacher would have gotten fired if they fired. Had put a single student in their car alone. Like, you couldn't be alone in a room with a student in the school with the doors closed. So that very much felt like this. that made the book feel, like, dated to me a little bit. But also, yes, right. don't do that. Yeah, Mr. Freeman um, was wild. All of her teachers were wild. When uh, at the end, when Mr. Freeman was like, "Man, you've been through some stuff, right?" <laughs> like, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, she has." <laughs> Thank you so much for noticing, man. Oh my god. I just yeah, I don't know. I don't remember what he was like in the book, and I I can't decide if like the art of him slashing stuff and throwing things makes him seem more unhinged or if there was probably more stuff in the prose book that like made it equal and I kind of want to know um I'm so sorry I had to find the panel Jackie's talking about where oh, her yes. art teacher literally <laughs> says you've been through a lot haven't you please look at this man's expression oh my gosh this man could not mean it any less mm -hmm. if he tried that's literally You've been through some stuff, haven't you? Yes, like that's what she was trying to like show. The kind of, yeah. Come what on. were you gonna say, Jackie? He seems like the kind of artist that, like, you know how like they talk about like Van Gogh and like we wouldn't have Van Gogh if like his artwork if he wasn't you know depressed or something like that. Like he's the kind of artist who feels like you have to suffer for your art. Yes. And oh yeah, like plays up those like those like really negative sort of behaviors in like pursuit of your art and I'm not I'm not about that. Yeah. <laughs> hey kids. I won't go to therapy because it will affect my creativity, which yeah. is yep. not true because going to therapy and treating your mental illness helps you to be more productive. Don't also, fall into that trap. Hey kids, if someone ever asks you, well, where would we, where would we have, how would we have Van Gogh? Like, what would we have if he hadn't had depression? The answer is we would have had Van Gogh for longer. Yep. Like, I think there's like something to be said for creating art when you are in a place where like you are suffering or you're not feeling your best and creating art as a way of processing and healing. But to suffer simply for the sake of feeling like you will make something, that ain't it, folks. Go to therapy. Nope. Next slide, maybe, because I think it might relate to something that Twitch Cell just said in the chat. Uh, nope. Okay, we can skip this one. It's fine. I just liked this Oh, panel. Mr. Neck. Yes. The history Oh, my God. Uh, so Twitch Cell mentioned that her history that, teacher is also wild. And he is wild in a fully different way. By which I mean, he is not wild. He is racist and xenophobic. Mm -hmm. Okay, not to like <laughs> make this about like my own high school experience, but has <laughs> everyone seen that joke that's like, the reason nobody knows anything about US history is because all your history teachers were football <laughs> coaches? <laughs> heard that was that <laughs> like, at your school it's gonna be like this is my history teacher in high school a hundred percent not specifically shout out to mr p we stand forever but like literally my high, my old high school had an issue in this past year about a teacher like going on bigoted rants at the beginning of class right. and like the students had to be like maybe that's not okay and do you know what that man is still employed 
And David is such an icon for standing ah. up to it so effectively, Ooh, recording so it. I, just to have that like sense of self as a high schooler, very proud of him. David full on bringing a camera and a tripod to class and yep. being like, absolutely try it. Absolutely try it. Mm -hmm. Oh my but, God. Like, you incredible. can tell like David had support to be able to feel like he could do that. Like he talks about, you know, lawyers, which obviously he's getting from his family. Like yeah. a 14 year old doesn't have his own lawyer. So like, that is a very, like, I love David, but I'm like, you can, you feel like you can do that for a reason. Yeah. yeah that's a good point. Yeah. Um, all right. Next slide. We're like almost to the slide, so we should be ending right on time. Um, the last two slides I put in were just these lists that Melinda has in the book <laughs> of lies that they tell you in high school. Some of the lies on these lists are definitely things that are tinged by her anxiety, depression, trauma that hopefully are not actually lies. They just feel like lies to her. But some of these were so funny and so <laughs> true to me. Yes. Um, I don't know if there were any in particular that really stuck out to you guys. I know mine are on the next slide that I liked the most. Um, um, the you will have enough time to get to your next class before the bell rings. Yeah. Literally oh, yeah. comical. I went to a very small school and it was still like very hard to like go to your locker and get your stuff and get to your next class. Like, excuse me, sir, I'm not carrying six textbooks around. Oh yeah. Um, if you want to go to the Number next eight one. about your schedule. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Like, it's sure. Sure. So it's uh, like before or after you cut like all the arts. Right. <laughs> They that are all in, in the same period, so you can only take one. My school yeah. was like, yeah, we always like we always take your scheduling needs into consideration. They put me in pre-calc. Girl, I can't be in pre-calc. Like, mm -mm. I can do math. <laughs> I can't do math. Like, I, uh, so then I had to, like, switch my whole schedule around to get out of a math class that I was inevitably going to fail. So that's a lie. She's right. Yeah. Um, I laughed out loud at we are going to figure figure out how to turn off the heat soon <laughs> that one was just so real <laughs> yeah uh ours was they couldn't figure out how to get the heat to turn on mm. we would like go to school in, in our jackets also like number 10 is very much like they don't want to hear what you have to say. Like, no. I've heard teachers complaining about, like, the students that speak up about things. So, no. But we yeah. want to hear what you have to say. Come to your teen librarians and youth librarians. We're cool. Absolutely. We yeah. That's, like, I don't know. Like, I, I do care. And yes. maybe that's why, like, I don't know, this book made me so angry. is because oh. I never want to become the type of adult who misses this in a kid yeah. you know like I don't ever want to see somebody I know and then find out like l way later after they've had to like literally physically attack their assaulter to make them stop that mm -hmm. they were going through something that I should have noticed and recognized and offered my help with so mm -hmm. hey kids like talk to somebody you trust who's actually going to listen and it's not always going to be a teacher. It may not always be a guidance counselor. Keep looking. There will be somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think that's probably a good note to end on. I know we have some people that have to get to other meetings. So thank you guys for joining us to talk about this or watching it later on yeah. demand. Um, I think it is a it's an emotional tough book, but it's a really good book. I think all three of us would definitely recommend checking it out. And we will see you next month on January 21st yes. to discuss March Book One, a graphic novel um, that tells the true story of John Lewis, a civil rights activist. Woo! Ready for that? Yeah. All right. All Bye, right. Guys. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. I just realized only Chris can make it stop.